Hi, I'm Matt Shepard. And I'm Chad Shepard. Coming up on this edition of Shep Shower and Shave, who do the Red Wings and Pistons need to add in free agency? Pro Football Focus ranks the Lions roster near the bottom of the league. Were they overachievers last year, or do you disagree with the ranking? That's all coming up on this edition of Shep Shower and Shave, brought to you by Fifth Avenue in Royal Oak, always a premier destination with over 36 cold beers on tap, great food and drink specials, a kitchen that is open till 2 a.m., and... They've got 40 HD TVs to check out the Red Wings, Tigers, Lions, Pistons, Michigan, and Michigan State. We're also brought to you by Northwestern Tech, the HVAC school that works. Call right now, 248-358-4006, or go to northwesterntech.edu. Heating and cooling employers are desperate for trained technicians. No better place to get that training than Northwestern Tech. Red Wings and Pistons are in a mode right now where they're trying to find ways to improve. They've already done that through the draft, they believe. Red Wings had 11 draft picks, although it was widely poo-pooed. And the Red Wings, or and the Pistons, I should say, had one and spent it on Luke Kennard. Let's take it one team by at a time. The Pistons first. Who do you think the Pistons need to improve their roster? They've got a big decision with Contavious Caldwell-Pope. Give me one guy you'd like to see wearing a Pistons uniform next year who you think could drastically improve this team. Well, my uh, my biggest need for the Pistons, and I think the biggest need for a lot of people, was a guy that can put the ball through the through the hoop, like right. Luke Kennard can. Right. So, to be honest with you, I would kind of flip that back really quick before I give you a name. Uh, do you think Luke Kennard fills that need enough Not totally, on his no. own? Okay. No. So that was the question I was going to ask. What what are his deficiencies that still need to be plugged, either by free agency or by internal an internal gap? Right. There's a few things this Pistons team needs. Okay. But you're right. Shooting is is first and foremost. They do not have very good shooters. J.J. Redick is the obvious choice. They're not going to get Kevin Durant. They're not getting LeBron James. They're not getting Steph Curry. They're not getting Kyle Lowry or Chris Paul or somebody of that ilk, although Chris Paul wouldn't necessarily fill that. It's J.J. Redick, and it's J.J. Redick because, look, here's a guy who's in really good shape. He's probably a little bit better defender than most people would give him credit for. He moves very well without the basketball. He's a very good passer, and I know he's 33, and I know he was underpaid a year ago. The Clippers only paid him a little bit more than $7 million. This is a guy who probably has a good three years left in his career. And I think if you can get him on a two- or a three-year deal, I think he would be ideal for this team. The free agents that are out there, the point guards of Drew Holiday and George Hill and guys like that, Deion Waiters, those guys are not all that appealing. The only other guy I could think of is maybe as a Danilo Gallinari. He's a small forward, played in Denver. I know the Knicks are after him. Dallas is probably after him. Boston is after him. He's, he's a long, athletic player who – Shot 35%, a little bit better than 35% each of the last three seasons. He could spot up. He could shoot it. He can deck it and drive it. But he's injury prone. That's the problem. He's more of a role player than anything else. He does not have to be the superstar. You don't necessarily need that guy to be a superstar on this team. And I think he would be a nice fit, too. The problem is... You know, you've got a lot of small forwards. You've got Tobias Harris. You've got Marcus Morris. You drafted Henry Ellenson. I don't know if there's room for him on this team unless you make some additional moves or consequential moves to sign a guy like that. I think J.J. Redick would be the ideal fit, but if you couldn't get him because he doesn't want to go to a place where they don't have a chance at winning anytime soon, Gallinari might not be a bad alternative for this team. I like that line of thought, and I also like it because it wouldn't – I mean, the Pistons are already projected, I believe, be over the cap or pretty – darn close to it they're not yeah. one of those teams that has a ton of money and can they go don't. like right. you said spend it on a chris paul a blake right. griffin guys like that um my question is does this kind of pigeonhole the pistons into a situation where do you feel they really need they have no choice but to pay kcp well i think they're going to and and you're right i think it's because they don't have any other choice because if if they if if they were in the mix if they were almost i don't want to say guaranteed but if they felt really good about chances to upgrade that position with a guy like reddick who could keep the seat warm until a guy like canard could fill the void then i don't think detroit would have a problem the problem is that you know you're going to you're going to have to pay for Contavious Caldwell Pope too the other name that a lot of people have brought up is Rudy Gay now he's got a ton of issues um, first and foremost, he's had some problems with his Achilles. 
Achilles injury. Um, and he's, he's not necessarily all that versatile either, but he's another guy that people could think of in a Pistons uniform. But yeah, I mean, to, to your point regarding Contavious Caldwell-Pope, yeah, I think eventually this team is going to end up signing him and uh, they're going to fall into the same rut that the Tigers and I think the Red Wings have been in where they're basically strapped with the same personnel being a slightly overpaid, but you haven't really improved your team all that much. Are they at least in a better situation given the fact that KCP is... If he's not their best two-way player, he's certainly one of the two best, and he. Probably well, that's a good point. Yeah, look, I, look, I like Contavious. I, I like Contavious Caldwell Pope, and I think he's a good player. He's not a superstar. I don't think he's going to be worth the money that they're going to have to end up paying him, though. That's the problem. And what, he does it. What, I meant what does he that? do really, really well? Well, here's here's what I meant by that. I didn't mean to entirely break down every aspect of his game. I meant when we compare him to bad contract situations, the Tigers in bad, bad contract situations, the Red Wings are in. The Red Wings' bad contracts are bad because yeah. they're to guys who aren't worth that much money or who are overvalued to right. a certain extent. Right. Even though we've said repeatedly how much we love this guy, Justin Abdicator is a guy who's eight years a term, you know, long deal. And those aren't the contracts people are upset about. It's the Ericsons, it's the Helms, and things yeah. like that. Yeah. So my point is if you're going to have to overpay somebody or give somebody too much term, at least make it the best guy on the floor for you, and that's KCP. So if you're going to overpay somebody – I guess but, but if this he's is the, the best, one you can live with just, the most. Just because he's your best guy doesn't mean that he deserves that money. He's just but, he's but, your okay. best guy, but he's he's not even close to being uh, uh, that great at his worth, position. It's not what he's worth in the league. It's what he's worth to you. And that's what the that's what the Lions are about to go through with Matt Stafford. They're, they're not no, going to. That's, that's different. Matt Stafford's a top 10 quarterback in the NFL. He's coming off a top 10 quarterback in the NFL anyway. Contavious Caldwell Pope is not viewed as that as the best shooting guard in the league. My point by that is you have to pay him what he's worth to your franchise, not to what some other team might pay him because they have a different situation. Maybe they have a different set of receivers, a different offensive line in the, in the basketball parallel. Uh, they've got a, a point guard who runs the show in a way that Reggie Jackson doesn't for the Pistons, and they don't need their two as much. The Pistons rely more on KCP and are more at a disadvantage without him than other teams would be without him. And that's why you have to pay him more. I think that's where we disagree. Just just because he's that valuable to you doesn't mean that you overpay him. I mean, you're he's he's not a great player. He's not an all-star player. He's not widely viewed as a top 10 player at his position. So why would you waste the money? Lack of a better phrase. Why would you spend the money on a guy who you don't think is worth it just because you feel like you have to do it. I mean, he makes 33% of his threes, for crying out loud. Think about the number of twos that you'd rather have than Contavious Caldwell-Pope, whether it be DeMar DeRozan, C.J. McCollum, Bradley Beal, uh, Clay Thompson, obviously, Jimmy Butler. We could go on and on and on. J.J. Redick is included in there as well. Uh, some people might even think Dwayne Wade, Nick, uh, Nick Batum might be one of those guys. Uh, Chris Middleton, who Detroit got rid of, might be one of those guys. Uh, Victor Oladipo, to a certain extent. They are all part of a, a, a system, but don't get paid. They're, they don't make nearly as much as a guy like uh, Contavious Caldwell-Pope is envisioned to make $20 million because of Detroit's need. Do you think this team could go without making the playoffs without Contavious Caldwell-Pope? Yes. They went without making the playoffs with Contavious Caldwell-Pope. And I think he can be an important part to this team. That's not my point. My point is he's not worth that kind of money. In general, let somebody else flip that tag. You've already done that with Andre Drummond, and you've right. done it with Reggie Jackson. You're right. It doesn't make let sense. Let somebody else foot that bill, but be prepared to lose what he brought to you this next year. And if you're not going to spend the money on him, and you're not going to spend the money on finding that somewhere else, be prepared to suck. That's all well, I'm they saying. They sucked this past year with him. That's so, fair enough. Yeah. So that's, no, you're right. I that's, mean, maybe I overvalue him because of how bleak things look on the current Pistons roster, and that's something that you have to – Put into check before you sign yeah, that and, money and away. You're that's a great point. And by the way, you're, and I think you're right about it. I, I think he's the best all-around player on their team. But it's primarily because defensively he's really good. He's a really good perimeter defense, and that team makes him look that much better because they're a crappy defensive team. I would tell you this: for defensive player of the year honors yeah. votes, he got one. Yeah. All right. He's not first, second, third honorable mention. He's none of that. I'm trying to be responsible with my money. You're right. That's all I'm saying. You're right. All right, from an NHL standpoint, Red Wings, 
Who do they need? They need scoring, and they need back-end puck control. Is there anybody out there you think could possibly fit well in a Red Wings uniform? Brendan Smith is not going to come back. Kevin Shattenkirk's not coming here because, A, he's too expensive, and he's just not coming here. And I I guess the only other defenseman I can think of is Trevor Daly. Does Trevor Daly, at the age of 34, fit well with the Red Wings in your mind? Yeah, I think he does, and Craig Cussins from The Athletic has already made it put out there or put out there or made it public that the Red Wings are one of nine teams that have kind of walked down the, the line a couple steps one at of least nine. Trevor, Trevor Daly. Right. So mm. most of the league still wants this guy, even despite the fact that he's thirty four years old. The difference for him might be term, right? From a money perspective, the Red Wings will pay him um what he needs to be paid. I don't That's think right. they'll be largely, largely outbid um by a couple of these other teams, but the question will be are the Red Wings willing to give him the multiple years that some of these other organizations may because think about the role that Detroit wants to bring him in under. They want to bring him in as a guy to bridge the gap until some of these smaller, younger defensemen, Vili Sayarvi, Joey Hicketts, guys like that, are ready to come up and play regular NHL minutes. Until they can reach that point, Detroit needs a little bit of a bridge defenseman. Mm -hmm. Other guys that have been explored in this Custance article that he explains that the Red Wings have talked to, Ron Hainsey, who was a Pittsburgh defenseman, um, who helped win a cup for them last year, yep. and uh, Dan Girardi, who's coming off not such a strong season with the Rangers, could really use one of those, let me rebuild myself, rebrand myself on a one-year deal. Thomas Vanek example. Vanek is another situation in the another guy who's in that situation in the forward perspective. Now, No, I'm, I'm saying use that. That's an example. Oh, yeah, Thomas exactly. Vanek came to Detroit, exactly. rebuilt his reputation, and like, went to Florida. And like the way that t- Detroit flipped Thomas Vanek to Florida, they mm-hmm. would look to do the same thing with either Ron Hainsey, Dan Girardi, Trevor Daly, whoever these guys are, Sign him to a short year, a short deal, probably a one-year deal. Mm-hmm. And if you're not there at the deadline, you can flip them on a, fr- a cap-friendly number uh, to a, to a team that does need a depth defenseman or somebody to play in their their top four, their top six. Those are some of the. Um, Hainsey, by the way, in case people don't know, is 36, right? Is he not? Yeah, he's an older guy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So Daly's 34, Hainsey's 36. That's not all that attractive if you're a Red Wings team that is trying to rebuild. Right, but you have to look at what the market is out there. It's out there right now. Okay. Ottawa had to pay a big price for their expansion, uh, their expansion move, and they lost Mark Mathot to Vegas, who was flipped, flipped to yeah. the Golden Knights. Travis Hamanick was just worth three top two round picks to the Flames, and he's the number four defenseman on that team. Yeah, that's almost inconceivable, right? So we know that the price is as high as it's ever been and as we had Darren Elliott in earlier this week to explain to us that's why Vegas stockpiled defensemen that's the currency of the future and if they have one of those guys two of those guys three of those guys pan out that's a huge payday coming back and right. you're set on your own blue line help me on how they help the Red Wings because Hainsey when he was in Carolina before he was shipped to Pittsburgh was a minus 16 for the year he had four goals and he I think he had 17 assists or something like that 17 points on the year Trevor Daly a guy who played in Dallas a guy who played in Chicago for a year and now has been in Pittsburgh the last two years. Five goals, 19 points. Detroit's got plenty of defensemen who could do that. Are they really going to help their partner? Are they going to make their partner better in the plus-minus? Because as we know, guys like Mike Green was a minus 20. Danny DeKaiser, who's viewed as the future, he was a minus 22. Xavier Olette, I think, was the only defenseman who was a plus in the plus minus. And I think that's more appropriate and more attractive and more important to uh, the defense than it is for the forwards. I could be wrong there. But for the most part, I mean, that's kind of how they look at it. Nicholas Cromwell, minus 7. Nick Jensen, a minus 7. And I think Jensen is their best defenseman. But when you look at these other guys, I mean, Hainsey was a minus 16 in Carolina, suddenly gets to Pittsburgh, and he's a plus 8 or a plus 4, whatever it is, plus 8. It's it's not necessarily on him. It might be more on their partner. How do you look at it from a defensive standpoint? Well, I think the interesting question is the one that you talked about, and that's is he going to make the guys around him better? Uh, I think you want a veteran presence to have that sort of calming effect on your younger defenseman. Nicholas Cronwall has tried to do that, I think, for stretches, but I don't think Jonathan Erickson exudes you know calmness around him for the for the younger defenseman that he might be playing with. I think these guys could do that. Trevor Daly is a guy who played more than 20 minutes a game the last two years for the d- defending back-to-back Stanley Cup champions. He's got almost a dozen teams trying to talk to him in free agency. There's something to that, okay? Sure. And I know you're not trying to suggest otherwise. 
Um, but those are those are important considerations. I think Trevor Daly is able to play some special teams numbers for you mm-hmm. in a way that maybe you don't have a ton of those guys right now. Yeah, Mike Green, that's and the, it. And the res- he's a responsible player. But here's the biggest thing to me is that uh, he's a guy who can carry the puck up the rush for you if you need. Now, he's not a blazing speedster. He's not going to do for you what um, – what a couple other players around this league can do, like Oliver ekman Larson down in Phoenix or Eric Carlson in Ottawa, but he's responsible with the puck enough to, to create, I think, opportunities for other players, and he would make Detroit play faster on the back end, and that's part of what we've talked about is that they are a slow-moving team with and without the puck, and when you're slow-moving and you cannot create quick opportunities in transition to take advantage of the Athanasius, the Larkins, the Helms, the guys that you mentioned at the top of this segment uh, that do have the speed up at the forward ranks, then it doesn't matter. And more importantly, every one of these guys, Ron Hainsey, Trevor Daly, and Dan Girardi, has averaged 20 minutes or more for multiple seasons going back in a row. Dan Girardi was over 19 last mm-hmm. year, but he's played 20 minutes every other year since 07, 08. I acknowledge that he's coming off a worse year last season. He only had 15 points, but he's never been a 40, 50 point guy. Uh, Hainsey played 21 minutes last year, 22 the year before, 22, 22, 21. He's consistent at that number for you. Well, and me, Trevor me, Daly's played more than 20 minutes for the back to back defending Stanley Cup let, champions. Let me bring up this point, though. You said for their young defense. At what point do we stop thinking they're young? Danny DeKaiser's 27. Jonathan uh, yeah, Erickson's but I don't 33. Him. I don't mean Mike those Green's guys. 31. I don't, Mike, Mike Green and Jonathan Erickson okay, don't need you, to come in and learn from Trevor Daly okay, about how to be you, an NHL who, player. Then who are you talking about? Guys that'll be rotational. The Cyarvis, the Hicketts, the, those players that. That haven't had a ton a of Russo if he gets gold. Yeah, up. haven't had a ton of so, but uh, don't NHL you, experience. But don't yet. you have that in in Cronwall, who's thirty six, and as I mentioned, Erickson, who's thirty three, and Green, who's thirty one. Why can't they learn from those guys? Why does Detroit have to go get another guy who's going to help groom the next guy? Why can't they get a guy who's an impact player? Because they have failed to lure them in repeatedly over the last several years, and that's the the black and white answer. They haven't landed those big free agents. They're right. not going to get Kevin Shattenkirk this year. It's going to happen again. So some people think Kevin Shattenkirk's a little overrated because of what happened with him in Washington. That he be, was a little exposed. But this is part of the same discussion that we've had: is how how valuable is he to your team? Yeah, and is he worth more money because of that? And if you're a Red Wings, I mean, we've entertained the possibility before about trading a Dylan Larkin and Andreas Athanasiu for. A right hand shot defenseman, or for right. a, for, a, for a Jacob Trouba or yeah, a Cam for somebody Fowler. like that. So if do you think that's overpaying for that for that defenseman? You know, if that's a square I market don't. deal. I mean, personally, I don't. I, I really don't. I mean, I I, I think I, I've learned a lot from talking with you about hockey and Darren Elliott brought it up. You guys had a really good discussion about it on Monday. That the strength of a team has to be at its center position. Dylan Larkin, Andreas Athanasiu, the future of this team from a center standpoint. But I would love to have a puck-moving, right-handed, big defenseman who can log a ton of minutes and play in a ton of different situations to help build my back end. And, and I so, think a Jacob Truba would be a so would thirty other NHL GMs. And right. I'm not saying, but that, that's why I would that's why I would risk losing one of those fair. two you just that's put. fair. I'm yeah. not saying that that price is too big to pay. Mm-hmm. What I'm saying is you have to make that parallel in free agency. Right. Do you have to then overpay a little bit there? What's a greater harm? Would you rather overpay dishing away prospects and young, um, young uh, promising players? And, again, we mentioned that we don't necessarily think that is overpaying for a guy, yeah. somebody like Truba. Or would you rather overpay in free agency with your dollars and create a difficult cap situation? I get the it. The Red Wings have an unenviable cap situation. I'm not eager for them to go make a fiscally irresponsible deal. But if it's one year – Bring in Trevor Daly because I believe he'll be better than Jonathan Erickson. I believe he'll play more games. That, that's maybe an than assumption that Trevor Daly is going to accept a one-year deal, and at 34, I doubt he's he the will. least likely guy yeah. to do that. But yeah. a Girardi may. Yeah. If you can get Dan Girardi in here to play on your second power play unit, give you give you, maybe he can even score uh, a dozen goals for you or ten goals for you. Maybe yeah. he gets eight goals and you, the five of those are on the power play, and he's playing 22 minutes a night for you as the number four guy in your top four. That's worth to me a one-year deal, especially if you're out of contention at the deadline next year, and you have to be able to flip, uh, have some assets to flip. I think that it's not totally unreasonable to think that that's part of the decision making. You never presume you're going to miss the playoffs or be terrible, but you have to have a contingency plan to acquire assets if you are out of it at that time, instead of just skating into the offseason with no major changes to make. Look, in a perfect world, you trade a guy like Gustav Nyquist or Thomas Tatar, a draft pick, and a young defenseman for 
a guy like Jacob Truba right. or a Cam Fowler, right-handed shooting, puck-moving defenseman, yes, that's probably not going to happen because that's not nearly enough to get from those teams. Because there's not a single team in the league that has a surplus of what that, of what the Red Wings need. And it's a really bad time to try and be a buyer. It's a seller's market, and there aren't many sellers. Right, and Detroit doesn't have the defense to try and make up for it. There's no question about it. Before we shift gears to the Lions, just a reminder that Northwestern Tech has what you need for your career at Northwestern Tech. HVAC is all they teach. So they're perfected the hands-on program for the last 38 years. Their flexible scheduling allows you to keep working your job while training for your actual career. So try this. Call some of the big HVAC companies in the area. Ask them where you should go, and it's going to be unanimous. Northwestern Tech is the HVAC school to get trained, certified, and into the field in only 10 and a half months. You can call them at 248-358-4006 or go to northwesterntech.edu. Recently, Pro Football Focus came out and said the Lions ranked 28th in terms of talent in the NHL or the NFL. Uh, the teams below them, all under 500 teams, and yet Detroit made the playoffs a year ago. Are they undervaluing Detroit, or did Detroit get away with something a year ago that we failed to recognize considering their talent ability? That's a really fascinating question to me, especially because of the ire that Jim Caldwell draws from this town. So for PFF, which is pretty much the most widely respected uh, independent football metric provider or football evaluator, uh, it's the only one I know of where actual football coaches see these other guys breaking down plays and say, okay, there's some credence to that because most people are just trying to guess at the outcome or right. not necessarily sure about the construct of a play. So how funny would it be to watch Detroit fans squirm at the notion that Jim Caldwell helped that Lions roster overachieve last year? What a funny concept. Now, part of that, I think, is because of the schedule. Lions have a much more difficult schedule this year, and I think that most people would agree that last year's schedule was not the most challenging one they've ever seen. And it's difficult for us to tell that on the outset, right? We, right? we start trying to add up wins before the season's even started. There are surprise teams in the league every year. Part of what makes the NFL great is the teams, is of the eight teams that might make the playoffs last year, I think only six of them are going to be back, or maybe even fewer. It might be half. Um, that is a part of the appeal of the NFL, is the quick turnover where you can fall off the mountain quickly or climb up it quickly. Uh I think the Lions may have overachieved a little bit last year, especially given the poor quality of play across the offensive line. We, in this town, I think we're quick to praise Jim Bob Cooter for devising a plan that works to Matt Stafford's strengths, yeah. gets the ball out of hands quickly, out of his hands quickly. We fail to recognize that's not just to Matt Stafford's strengths. That's to our Lions, or our offensive line's strengths and to their weaknesses, so they don't have to pass protect for more than a half a second. It's to get the ball in the hands of playmakers like Theo Riddick, Amir Abdullah when he's healthy, and Golden Tate, who is the maybe the best receiver in the NFL after the catch in terms of breaking tackles and yards after the catch. So that's not just for Matt Stafford. It's yeah. the way the whole roster is built. Yeah. That's exciting to see, to see our coaches uh, adjust in a way that benefits our team and doesn't also maybe benefit the other team or, or could be make things more difficult for, for them to play against us. It adds to our strengths. It boosts... Um, our advantages that we have over the other team, and I, I'm excited about that aspect. Now, the idea that they overachieved last year, they're not going to overachieve the same way this year, I think, is, is the way a lot of people are looking at it. And because that's why the schedule? It, yeah, I think yeah. that's that in combination with the Taylor Decker injury because people yeah. now know right. what that was and expected. Right. And it kills me how fa- how quickly people are soured on the Lions' offensive line. Did you forget what they did to the right side? Right. Because if you didn't draft Taylor Decker last year, played the whole season, and just made these two signings, people would be doing backflips. Correct. And instead, just because of the Decker loss, it's perceived as an entire step backwards, and I don't agree with that notion at all. Just so p- in case people didn't see the ranking, the, the only teams worse than Detroit, Cleveland, which is right behind them, San Francisco, which is ranked 30th, uh, the Rams, who went 4-12 and at 31, and then the Jets at, at 32. So they really think Jacksonville has better personnel than I, I, the Lions do? Or here, Indianapolis here's what I would does? tell you. That's a little surprising. It's, it's really surprising to me because they graded every single player. Six received poor scores from last year. Eric Ebron, TJ Jones, Graham Glasgow, Haloti Nada, Tier Whitehead, and Condre Diggs. I think Ebron's going to be better. I think Glasgow is going to be better, too. So I think that's those are two areas. Whitehead was playing not out of position, but asked, he was in over his head and will be put in a more comfortable role this year. And I would say the same about D.J. Hayden, who came over from the Raiders. No will question. do something different from the lines than what he did there. The, the, the good, high-quality grades you had, Travis Swanson, Rick Wagner, Darius Slay, Nevin Lawson, Glover Quinn, 
Tavon Wilson. Don't want to get into that right now. That's interesting. The the elite scores were well, and not even elite. Um, they they it was the highest scores were Stafford and uh, T J Lang. Mm-hmm. Okay, and, and Decker was obviously a very good player, but he wasn't listed because he's hurt. I think I think Detroit's starters are much better than twenty eight. I think the depth is where the issue comes into play. I'll give you an example. How much does pro football focus take into Miles Killebrew, who has made great strides and will be a much more impactful player? Same thing with Gerard Davis. How much can they gauge his impact on this team? Antoine Williams is going to be a better player and help this team a little bit. I think they're lacking at the wide receiver, but they don't know how to how to rank right. Kenny, Galladay Kenny Galladay right now. And I think because the injuries to the running backs, that's really hurt them. But I think overall, I think if you look at Detroit's starters, just talking about starters now. Remember, Ziggy Anza was hurt last year. He got a poor grade because of his injury. He comes back healthy, you're in much better shape. I think the depth hurts them. The, the, along that front defensive line, Ansa and Nada and Ashawn Robinson, right. not, Kyrie Thornton suspended now. You got a couple of right. other issues, but but those three guys, pretty darn good. Yeah. Not great. I'm not comparing them to the to the you know to the it's the New defense. England Patriots yeah, or anybody you. like that. But pretty darn good. I think their linebacking crew is going to be better because you're going to have guys, as you mentioned, guys in in positions that are probably fit their skill set a little bit better. I think their back end is much deeper than it's been. And I think the starters of the offensive line, and if you can keep the running backs healthy, I think 28 is too low. I think the a big reason they, they fall to 28 is because of the depth this team has or the lack thereof. And that's something that Bob Quinn has tried to build upon. Absolutely. you got to create competition at every position you possibly can. We've talked about that. you got to make – guys fight for their job so they're not just handed a job right and uh, i think bob quinn's done a good job creating that kind of culture i would agree with you that 28 seems startlingly low as a ranking but i also understand the perception of depth and i would argue this when's the last time the lions really relied on their depth and had a successful season i'm not saying that it's not a a a component to Mm -hmm. measure in the equation but if the team repeatedly when it when it does find flashes of success is doing it with just the you know the surface level guys, I, I guess maybe they shouldn't be quite as harshly penalized for I, not having I, that depth would, when they've never really had that depth. I, I can tell you this, and I'm not saying they're top ten, so don't take it the wrong way. I would much rather have Detroit's personnel than the Washington Redskins. Yeah, and the Washington Redskins are ranked seventeenth. I Detroit, I think Detroit is somewhere in that mix. Their ranking should be somewhere along there. So an example, you talked about a guy like Miles Killebrew who's made strides that they're really not going to be able to account for because you don't see it on tape last year. There right. isn't there isn't the tape to evaluate, and that's really all they're basing these projections off of. An example of that might have been two years ago, Travis Swanson. They would have failed to project Travis Swanson to be contributing piece to that Lions Good team. Good example. Yep. What turned out is that he had a fantastic season, one that actually secured him the center position for the remainder of the year and made him the incumbent heading into the following season. PFF wouldn't have seen that coming. You and I probably wouldn't have seen that coming, yet it played a big factor in the Lions' success. Same thing with Graham Glasgow. I think Absolutely. Graham Glasgow is going to be a better player this year than he was last year, not because he's in year two, but just because of who he is. And I think once he gets locked down to a certain position, not having to worry about center, guard, whatever, he's going to be your left guard. I think he's going to be a better player for this team next right. year. So to phrase it in a way uh, – in a way that would, I don't know, change things up a little bit. It's like they don't know that the set of responsibilities is changing for that player. That folk, The focus for that player is changing. Their their field of vision is narrowing. They now have one job as opposed to many or a more specific job or a different set of knowledge heading into that job. And it's difficult for PFF to evaluate that. I'm not suggesting that's an oversight on their part. It just makes you and I a little bit more bullish on the Lions' talent on the outset. Will that translate to a better record? It's a different conversation entirely. The, the, who they rank as the best player on the team might surprise you. Who do you think it is? If it goes by highest graded, it would have remained T.J. Lang. I, I would think. Yeah, it was. It was T.J. Lang. Yeah. Okay, and I only happen to know that that's his highest grade from the past year. But that, again, who is the most talented player on the Lions team? It's probably got to be Matt Stafford or Ziggy Ansa, I think, yeah. if you look at it that way. Neither of those two guys produced the highest grade last year, so PFF doesn't put them in consideration for that title, even right. though you and I feel that they're more deserving. I would tell you this. If Ziggy Ansa 
this coming season has a year like he had two years ago, that pro football focus ranking ain't where it is. But because he's coming off, and I understand, coming off a disappointing season, one that was hampered by injuries, I totally get it. I just think this team's starters are better than 28th in the NFL, and I would argue it's probably somewhere middle of the pack. Just because it's that doesn't mean that I think this team is destined to be Super Bowl representatives, division winners, or anything like that. A lot still has to be proven. I would just say, when you look at this team right now, they're better than 28th, and I don't think people should freak out too much about it. And likewise, that comparison goes the other way. T.J. Lang's high grade that yeah. comes from him playing in the Packers scheme with Aaron Rodgers right. behind him and right. a different running, you know, yeah. uh, a different running back and different set of players on either side of him. So it's not fair to take that grade and translate to that to an automatic plug and play. The Lions automatically get that level of production next year. We talked last week about the quick action of Bob Quinn to replace the left tackle position and that Jeff Schwartz, who was with the Lions in training camp for a while, Mm -hmm. I believe two falls ago, um, said that he thinks it's a good fit. The Lions offensive line, and we've even talked about it in this episode, does not necessarily operate the same way most offensive lines across the NFL do. Certainly not the same way they do in Green Bay. So T.J. Lang might even grade better because in in the Lions scheme. That might be even more conducive to his skill set. I don't think this is the case, and I don't think that the Lions would have signed him if it was, but hypothetically speaking, he could grade worse yeah. if that's not a good signing for what the Lions are going to ask him to do. That's why it's so critical that your coaching staff, your front office, your management are on the same page. Because if I if I get you, you're what? You're about 5'10 and change. How much do you weigh? About 190? 190, We're yeah. on there. If I go get you to be my small forward on my local basketball team, I'm not going to look very good. But if I go find somebody who's a couple inches taller, you know, who fits the role better, putting players in the right roles is the most difficult uh, skill to have in professional sports front office operations. And that's why the guys that can do it the right way are these these viewed as these brilliant engineers of these championship organizations because it's not an easy thing to do on paper a lot of guys fit differently and we all think we can be the fantasy manager of the year but you you cannot create that tangible that intangible chemistry and those other elements on paper a guy who has the vision to be able to see it and bring it to fruition is something special i think we have one in bob quinn here in detroit 